Welcome, everybody, to a new episode of CBSI Presents Indie Spotlight Series. We have a great show for you tonight. We have James Hake from Scout Comics. James, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm James. I'm with Scout Comics. Uh, yeah, very excited to be here, man. I love the articles, love the website. Yeah, it's an absolute honor. Thanks for having me tonight. Right. We're really excited to have you, too. And joining us, as always, one of our co-hosts here, we have Jack DeMeo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo. Go and say hello, buddy. What's going on, everybody? Simple Men's Comics family, CBSI Nation. As Brian said, I'm Jack DeMeo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo. And it's my pleasure to be here again with the Indie Spotlight series show, one of ComicBookInvest.com's best articles on the website that premieres every Tuesday on ComicBookInvest.com. And, of course, we have the writer of the Indie Spotlight series, Andy Tomberlin, joining us. He's the third man on our team. Andy, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hey, what's up, everybody? CBSI Nation. Uh, I'm Andy Tomberlin. I write the Indie Spotlight series over at CBSI, and I uh, couldn't be happier to bring you this guest in James Hake here uh, with Scout Comics. Uh, I'm really excited to get into this and, and see what we got. Right on. So we introduce the crew for tonight. And again, James, welcome to the show. For those unfamiliar, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you came together with Scout Comics? Sure. I started, gosh, I've been a comic fan since I was eight. I've been a collector at heart for many, many years. And uh, yeah, I've always wanted to get into the industry. And I decided to I had come up with a concept of Solar Flare. Long story short, I looked at Kickstarter, had just really taken off. So I... um crowdfunded. I did research. Sales is my background and crowdfunded the first six issues. And then I wanted to take it to the next level by getting diamond distribution. Long story short, like I ended up signing a deal with, uh, with Scout. A uh, big reason was because of the multimedia ties that they have. Uh, the founder of Scout, Brenda Deneen, used to be the head of the Macmillan publishing branch of uh, basically he would take books from Macmillan and turn them into film. And great dude, but I got to, that was a big reason. Then I, of course, met Jim Pruitt or James Pruitt, who uh, him and his brother, Joe, who runs Aftershock, they've been in the industry since the 90s. They were with Caliber initially, and I became best friends with them. And I just started helping out. And one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. And it's been about a year and a half since it's been part of Scout. And I was named president in October. We restructured and really in the past year and a half, it's taken the I think the, the industry by storm on how fast we've grown in such a short amount of time and the sky's the limit, like what we have planned in the future in the next year, I'm excited to share. I'm, I can't wait to share it to the world. A lot of these creators that we've uh, come to agreement with and the books that are coming out, it just, it's exciting. All, you know, the only thing that really kind of took a sidestep with, I never planned on doing this side of the business. I, wanted to be a writer and I still do. And that's my passion as well. But uh, in the past six months, I've kind of had to put that on the, the back burner in order to really help focus on scout. And it's been nice over the past uh, month. I've been really able to, to, you know, after we had a big grand opening of our uh, headquarters here in Florida, that uh, I was able to start uh, really getting into writing again. And it's, it's just been fun, man. It's I'm living the dream. And like I said, I'm a comic fan through and through. I read, Every company. Uh, I collect it. I get books monthly. I, I don't think I'll ever not get books monthly. So, yeah, man, it's it's an honor to, to I feel like I represent the fan and I hope it stays that way. So 100 hundred percent sounds that way for sure. I mean, uh, it's uh, you, you are living the dream. There's there's no doubt about it. Uh, you, you talked about how you kind of got in into Scout there with writing at Scout. Mm -hmm. Scout right now, the direction you're moving since you've taken over, what kind of properties are you looking for? Looking to kind of find your, your niche in the market there, you know? I mean, you've got some creators that are going for sci-fi route, you know? Some mm -hmm. that are going for the the blood and guts route, you know, the horror route. Uh, what, what's, what, what kind of stuff are you looking to do right now? Well, I, I, heard, uh, I did, heard an interview with Brendan, and he said it. He nailed it, where – Art gets you in the door, story keeps you there. And it's so true. And if you look at our wide variety of top titles now, we just came out with our most recent IP, like little brochure that we send out. And we represent 62 titles right now and counting. We signed two more today. 
And what we're looking for is just quality art and quality storytelling. It could be any different genre, from sci-fi to action adventure to all ages. We're looking for everything and just unique takes. But I'm kind of taking it to the next level is, uh, like I said earlier, I'm, I've been on the convention scene, pounding the pavement, like hustling across the nation. And I've met a lot of amazing artists and writers and people. And a lot of them I have brought on board with Scout, uh, Richard Rivera with Stabity Bunny, Joseph Schmulke, and Rich Woodle with uh, The Electric Black, Walter Osley. I mean, the list can go on. I can keep rattling them off. But yeah. what the key about these people are is they're making quality comics. They're hustlers, meaning they are invested in their own product. And they're good people. So I look at it like a team. I come from a sports background and we try to be a team, a family like environment and like you succeed, I succeed and vice versa. Right. So that's kind of what we're looking at. And um, yeah, it's going to be, we're just building this catalog and keep in mind, we are creator owned. Right. Meaning you, if you, the creator want to create a title and come to scout, you still own that title. We don't take ownership. Gotcha. Um, that's on our current business model. Could it change? Maybe, I don't know. But uh, we do take an agent fee um, because of the deep ties that we have with Hollywood. And I can tell everyone, speaking from my putting my creator hat on, like I, those ties are real and they are deep. I've experienced it firsthand and it's amazing. So I, I, like, I think I've said it before and I'll say it again, is there's an indie comic book revolution going on that the big boys are not seeing. And especially on the convention level and the Kickstarter level, and we're just, I'm just trying to help bring that to a, a wider audience, the actual comic world, so to speak. So, yeah, yeah that's um, kind of become my goal. And, yeah, I'm living yeah. the dream. That's, that's, that's awesome. I mean, uh, from what I get, I mean, it's a broad spe spectrum of what mm -hmm. you do. As long as it, the, the fire's there, you're looking for the, the fire from the creators and, and, and the passion, you know. And that's, that's pretty much what indie comics is, is all about. I mean, you've got... You've got some great titles. You mentioned one in Electric Black over there. I mean, you've got some good ones on the horizon. One of my favorites that comes to mind right off the bat is The Source, uh, Don, right Don's book, Don Hanfield. Tell us a little bit about Don and what, what he kind of brings to the table over there as well. Don, Don's become one of my closest friends, and uh, I'll give you a quick story on how we met. Um, because of my sales background, so I'm a financial advisor by day, and I've been running my own practice for a while. And one of the ways that I get new clients is I host seminars, like dinner meetings. And I have certain product vendors who will come out, and I'll I'll act as the host and the the yeah, really the host and speak about my business. And I just have been doing it for years. So a couple of years ago, San Diego is like the as we all know is like the Sundance Film Festival of the comic world, where Thanks to Walking Dead and other properties, like it, it's become a big thing. So the two owners at Scout couldn't make it, and or the original partners. And Jim, the publisher, was like, hey, do you mind coming with me and doing meetings? I'm like, man, I'd be honored. And I thought it was great, too, because I can, you know, I had my own stuff. So I can represent my own stuff no better than yourself. So, you know, we put out a, a package. They lined up all these meetings. And uh, one of the meetings was with uh, Don, and a lot of, I don't know if a lot of people know, but um, he has two production companies. One is Motor, which is just solely him, and then he has The Combine, which is 50-50 partners with Jeremy Renner. It's one of his best friends. Nice. So we met with him. We hit it off and uh, got to explain all the stuff. Just uh, this 30-minute meeting turned into two hours. Uh, and from what I understand, Jeremy was supposed to be at that meeting, too, but um, I guess he filmed he was filming that movie tag nice. and, uh, i don't know if you guys knew this but he broke both of his arms like filming that movie i did not it just, it just some it had just happened and don was telling us about it but uh it's like awful scenario i think it delayed some sh like extra shoots for uh, endgame because you know how they filmed endgame and uh yeah. infinity war at the same time so anyways it came up organically i was going to pitch the mall to had this idea for years I was going to pitch it to Aftershock because I self-fund Solar Flare. And I was like, I can't afford to self-fund two books. But if they're going to at least pay my artists and my creative team, shoot, you know, I'll try it. And I was getting a lot of buzz because of Solar Flare. So I just brought two pitch packets, came up organically. Don loved the idea, called me the, the day after San Diego. And we started negotiating and I 
became 50-50 partners with him. Wow. And we developed it together. And since then, we've become very close friends. Um, I brought Source on, you know, and we it's just been awesome. He's a great, great guy. The Source is an incredible book. If you guys haven't read it, it's it's just fantastic. It's like Harry Potter meets The Matrix. Yeah. You know, magic is real and it's been outlawed and it's got a, like ties to like the King Arthur legacy, but highly recommend it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's kind of with Don and, you know, uh, stay tuned because it looks like uh, Don's going to be even more integral part of Scout going forward. So I can't make any announcements yet, but yeah. I'm excited yeah. to have him on board. He's a great guy. Yeah, that's that's huge. He sounds like he opens up a lot of different doors for, for yes. you know, as a publisher, you know, and then and- that's. He's a he's a go getter too, man. He's yeah. a good person, a go getter, and he's a hell of a talented writer. Um, you know, oh, Dark yeah. Age is an incredible book. The Rift, which was you know, it's turned into a TV show. Amazing stories. Edward Burns is starring in it. Yeah, and he's episode one. I mean, it's he's real. He's got real ties, and he's a hell of an asset. That's for sure. Yeah, no doubt. All right, so while we're talking about Don, I got to ask. There, yeah. I, I've seen the Kickstarter for Unicorn. Unicorn. Like, yeah. uh, tell, tell me about it, man. That, that was is really interesting. It's in, it's incredible, and part of it's a passion project for him. Um, him and Joshua. Joshua Malkin is another screenwriter who they co-wrote the source together. Um, Don has a different approach for writing too, which is very cool. It's a very Hollywood approach because. When you do TV shows and whatnot, you're in a writer's room and it's multiple people. And the goal of those writers is to have the best available story available. Uh, You know, it's it's a really cool, interesting way to write. And that's I've learned to do it that way. Thanks to Don. But one of his partners is Joshua, Joshua Malkin. And they did the source and they're doing Unicorn because Unicorn takes place in the same universe as the source. That's kind of my question. Yeah, and he wanted to get it done as soon as possible because his daughter's at that age. And it's a very close story for him and Joshua because they've had, it's about people they love and people that they lost. And they got, it's pretty much the same mall team, sans me, and just replace me with Joshua. And because Rafael Loerio is uh, our artist for the mall. And um, yeah, he's the uh, artist on the unicorn too. And, it just was a hugely successful Kickstarter and highly recommend. And I'm sure there's going to be news about that coming soon on how to get that other than through Kickstarter. So yeah, stay that, tuned. That, that, that was kind of leading to my next question. So, <laughs> okay, perfect. Perfect. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, that one looks good. And, and the reason I asked about it too, is because I looked at the Kickstarter and, and I have a daughter of my own. She's seven, eight, right in that neighborhood. Oh, and it's, perfect for you. it's it's going to be perfect for, you know, and then, that's, uh, that's one I'm really, really excited about for sure. And, and he's kind of doing my uh, whole binge in, uh, idea. I convinced them to do a single issue and not, uh, at first and then a graphic novel immediately afterwards. I'm like, man, uh, use this model. I mean, it, it helps cater to collectors too. I think you really should. Yeah. yeah. So, and he did, which is, it's great. And he's got some really cool variants. I still think people can buy it actually if they want to get advanced copies. Even though the Kickstarter is over, he uses Backer Kit. So okay. if you search out Unicorn, Unicorn with a K, on Kickstarter, there's a way to still purchase and do some add-ons. Okay. Uh, it's oh. it's really cool. So I would highly rec- recommend people. It's I've seen I've been privy to a lot of the pages, uh, and oh, Rafael yeah. is a hell of a talent too, man. The artist. I'm gonna have to check that out because I, I had looked at the Kickstarter and I couldn't find where to get it. So yeah, that's yeah. Like, check it out, man. Just click on campaign. They don't make it really easy on Kickstarter, okay. unfortunately. Right, well, so, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's some good info right there for sure. If you're uh, if you're looking for that one, because it's uh, I believe that one's gonna be big from what I've what I've seen. I think so too, man. I think so too, and it's gonna be something for especially being a fa- I have a daughter as well. Like being able to yeah. share that. It's yeah. That's that's yeah. all. That's what it's all about. Yep. So he's, he's, yeah, it's great to have him. It's great to know him, but it's just one of the many perks of, uh, of, yeah. of being on this side of the business now. It's been awesome. Living the dream. Dude, no doubt. Dude. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> we got some great stuff coming out. Um, if you don't mind, I'll share a couple of the books. Yeah. I, I got a couple of them in today. So it's cool. Um, being here in the headquarters, we get books two weeks uh, before oh, yeah. they hit shelves. We get at the same time Diamond does, and Diamond takes about two weeks for distributing them. And man, I got t- 
tons of them today. I got Star Bastard three. I got Category Zero number one. I got the yeah. Mall number four. Um, what else did we? That's get? the one I'm waiting on right there. Uh, it's gonna be <laughs> great, man. I got the two covers. Our our cover from all four. We actually have three total covers. So we did an early release was a uh, Lost Boys cover. Um, that Walter Osley, he does Metal Shark Bro and Shiver Bureau. He did it for me. And uh, we gave it away at the headquarters for the grand opening on uh, April 20th. And then um, what else? Uh, the other two were The Untouchables was the retailer variant. And Uncle Buck was the regular cover. Nice. I love Uncle Buck. <laughs> yeah, it's one of my favorites too, man. Oh, hell yeah. I'm going to have to give that. There's no doubt. Metal Shark Bro. Three words that sound really cool, but I don't know that I thought I was going to be saying them when talking about a comic book title. But we talked about this title on the CBSI Bolo Show. And now, James, you guys are about to release your second series in what you guys are calling your binge series. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how this imprint came to be? What was the motivation behind it and what you're hoping to accomplish in the community? Well, yeah, like uh, I kind of mentioned earlier about how I was doing convention, you know, hitting the, the ground running and pounding the pavement by doing the conventions. And I was doing Solar Flare and I take inventory on everything uh, just because my background's in business and that's just what you do because you can chart things. And what I noticed was I would sell a ton of number ones of things and of, of solar flare or a set, you know, depending on how many issues I had out. The only time I'd sell the rest of the issues was if like I was in that area, you know, the previous year and hadn't released them yet. So it's sell number one sets and eventually the graphic novels. Uh, then learning, being on this side of the business and learning about diamond and how essentially four months ahead of time, we have to have solicitations ready for, for release. And if you're an independent comic company like we are, it's a really tough sell. First of all, our discount is, isn't as high as the big boys. It's usually anywhere from 5 to 10% less. On top of it, it's a lot of first-time or newer creators. So when issue one actually hits the shelves, typically issue three, most of the time four, are being solicited for comic stores. So this is a huge, huge loss leader in my, in my personal opinion. There has to be a better way under this system. So I think you know, being a, like a collector at heart, uh, when certain things get optioned or buzz goes behind them, you know, when they're individual issues, they seem to get hot and ex exceed value. And if it was a graphic novel, like if it was a, I don't know, a comic that became a graphic novel or a movie that became a graphic novel, it's that graphic mo novel doesn't really increase in, in value a lot, like, like an individual comic does. So I really came up with this, or put together this binge idea where, you know, everyone watches their TV now, binge it, thanks to the next, it's like the Netflix model. So you come out with a premiere issue. Uh, it's the test of the story, whether or not someone wants to continue it. And then you get the whole graphic novel three to four months later. Uh, and if it's a continuing series, you do season one, season two, or volume one, volume two. And that's what it does. You still have the collectability of the issue one. When the industry standard is a 50% drop from one to two, and you're still considered a success. I just think this this helps everyone involved, the creator, the comic book publisher, and the comic shop. Uh, I use Mindbender 3 as an example. It's one of my favorite books that we do. Uh, Jim Pruitt has become one of my best friends. He did, uh, I think that's his best issue. It just fires on all cylinders. Problem is, it's not self-contained. You have to read two in one to fully understand it. And I went to my local comic store here in Fort Myers, and they had three. And at the time, one and two came out, sold out, and four and five came out, and they were gone, too. He just has three on there. So as a comic shop, I put my comic shop, you know, uh, owner hat on, and I was like, man, that's a tough sell. You hope someone, A, really likes the art and is willing to pick it up, or B, that it becomes a hot back issue. And because of the lower print run, it's going to be worth more than a, the two and, and one. And that's just, that's a tough sell. So I think the binge, in my personal opinion, I love buying individual comics. I think I'll always will. But I really think it puts everybody in a position of success. And our really first test run was Monarchs, uh, which did very well. And then Metal Shark was our real, like, kind of put the, the marketing machine that we are, are building here behind it. And it's done very, very well. 
And our next one is called Princess Revolution, which, by the way, I got that issue number one in today, too. And uh, then uh, following that, we're basically going to start doing this. It was going to be every quarter, but now we're doing it um, every other month. And I think starting next year, we're going to do one a month. Uh, it, it just proved to be very successful. The retailers, we went to the Comics Pro meeting this year in February, and they were very, very receptive. Yeah, and I, I totally agree. From a um, coming from a CBSI comicbookinvest.com speculation perspective, um, mm -hmm. when you get optioned, as you said, you still have that first appearance, that number one issue mm -hmm. for back issue collectors to go back and get to slab. Um, with like with Metal Shark Bro, you had the uh, incentive variant, so there was still yep. that you know variant to go chase. Um, I think there was even some uh, retailer exclusive variants. So there was still that play out there. Um, so there, you kind of gave a little bit of everything, and then you give, like you said, that binge for that reader. Um, and when the and you're right, because when this from a back issue standpoint, when the series pops, nobody's going to go back and chase those issues three, four, five. Everybody's going to look for those issues one issue ones. We see that every time an option is announced. So mm -hmm. you still get that. I don't think you're taking anything away from the collector in that in in this scenario. Um, but you're definitely making it easier on the retailer, which is something I think a lot of collectors don't think about. They don't they don't see it from that retailer perspective. And keeping the retailers open, I'm sure you know, as a as a publisher more than anybody, yeah. is is the key in the lifeblood of the hobby. So a couple of the things that they actually complained, constructive criticism to my to this this idea, was are people going to complain that they're buying the first issue twice? So what we've done is we discounted the trade a little bit. That's one way. Um, I personally think that I think that this is my opinion and Jim and I go back and forth on it. I think we should keep it the regular price, but, uh, 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 the overall theme at comics pro this, this year was returnability. Uh, everybody wants returnability, all the comic stores. And I, I'm not a big fan of returnability cause I think that's a, it's like, Hey, we failed. So here, take it back. I think the, the just from my sales background, it's like, how about we give you sales ideas? on how to sell things, you know, instead of, so we don't have to deal with returnability. But to me, and the binge idea, and I'm messing around with, I don't know if we're going to do it. So, you know, I don't want to say too much, but I, I would love to make that first issue returnable. So if someone was really not a collector and truly a reader, which is what every publisher wants, and I think every collector even wants, because that just helps the industry as a whole. But uh, if a reader's like, hey, listen, I really like this. Can I give this back? and buy the trade and i think if that's the case i think we're i'm going to push towards making that issue one returnable or at least act as a coupon to get the regular issue yeah i mean i, I can say this i mean you spoke about it a lot the brain series in general and the more i hear you sell it talk about it not even sell it just talk about it i'm on board like it's it, you, you you do you cover all your bases you have your single issues you cover your reader. You, you you cover your CGC that you can still get on the wall. I mean, it's it's the way that that a B is a, a people. The, the people are going. You know. I mean, look at Netflix. Look at all the streaming services. Like you say, um, man, if this thing goes like you want it to, and it sounds like it is, by the way, that you're bumping up schedules and and, and starting to, to to do this more often. Um, man, to, you're yeah. in the wave of the future. To even constructively criticize myself with all how busy I've been, like I said earlier, my writing has taken a back seat. And uh, I mean, look at the mall. We've had delays on the mall. A lot of it's because of Scout and what's been going on with Don. And I mean, a lot of different things. It happens. Right. And it hurts an independent publisher. I'm well aware. We're all well aware. Yeah. You know, we've been lucky <laughs> with the source in, in the mall because of the buzz. Yeah. We've actually, it's actually helped the numbers, but that's that's not typical at all and the concept here is one of my favorite books and i highly recommend this to any, anyone who's listening um and jim will concur with this our favorite book out of everything that we've done if we had to pick one it wouldn't even be our own it would be smoketown um it's by philip kennedy johnson and scott van Demillion, who's doing midnight sky with jim but this is a masterpiece it was eight issues uh, i still think issue number two is single best individual comic that I've read in the past eight years. Wow. It's like the Fight Club where it's like, number one was great. It was good. But after you read number two, not only is number two amazing, but it makes number one that much better. Wow. 
And I, there were some delays on that one too. It was a, it was a quarterly book or excuse me, a bi-monthly book. So when seven and eight came out, like had been such a gap and I got, you know, you get busy. So I was like, I'm going to wait until the trade comes back and I'm just going to binge it all at one sitting. And uh, I've been doing this thing where I'm reading like graphic novels and stuff while I'm on the elliptical machine. I read that thing as soon as I got it from cover to cover. You know, I was on the elliptical machine for like an hour and 10 minutes and it was incredible. And I binged it and it was even better uh, than reading it individually because it's such a good story and I highly recommend it. Uh, It has been optioned for a movie. And it's being developed by the creator, Philip Kennedy Johnson and Von Stein, who's the, this director. Wow. And like, yeah, it's happening, which it could have happened to a nicer guy. Number one, uh, Philip is a class act. He works at boom as well. He does a uh, low, uh, low road West. I don't know if you guys read that. It's a great indie title. I did. I did. I did. The last Sons of Appalachia yep. and last sons of America and the war on Appalachia last sons of America is the one that was, uh, option by uh dinklage okay all right all right for Netflix, or actually in development not even option i think it's it's that next step but okay. uh, yeah, that's where i think been going, man i really do sorry if, for the long-winded answer i just get passionate no that's awesome that's that's what we want man i also think about what a lot brian i know you you gotta i know you can see this doing the social media with me but um a lot of our people they have trouble at various lcs is just getting access to indies so I think when you talked about the issue three still being on the shelf and what do you do with that? I think that's what happens a lot of times is if you're a reader and you maybe miss out on some hot series that comes out from a small press publisher and you try to find it, but issue one's popped up for 20 bucks on eBay. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you're less incentivized to read issue two, three, four, because you feel like you missed issue one so that you're already thinking, well, I'll wait for the trade. Um, Mm -hmm. so I think you avoid that. And then from a retailer perspective, you avoid the retailer getting stuck with issue two, three, four, and five uh, and trying to sell second and third printings and everything else. Yep. And this is the thing with the, with the binge, right? Like Monarchs, for example, that was kind of our first one. Um, Monarchs number one sold out. We we instantly went to a second printing. We will constantly do of that number one different things to give those people that opportunity but it still has a high probability of selling. We want to get, we want to build readership as a publisher. You yeah. do, but I also want to cater to the collector because I myself am a collector too. And I do not think a lot of publishers are doing that. I, again, just from the outside looking in, or it, it looks like most publishers hate collectors or speculators. Oh, they're ruining oh, the business. They do. I mean, That's how I feel. are they though? When you, when you look, the number who's buying all those number ones if it's a 50 percent drop james you just hit the nail on your head if there's a 50 percent drop that 50 percent represents the speculators that are yeah. dropping off that book so you're you're alienating 50 percent of your customer base on a regular basis yeah. which is why, why, can't you love both? why can't you love and, both? and that's what i'm saying because there's a way to marry both together yeah. there's a way for every and i tell that to like collectors who get mad at speculators i say you know a speculator shouldn't affect your ability to collect and let, let's be honest, a lot of speculators, like let's, let's, and this helps like with a lot of situations where if someone like does you wrong and like, just dissect that, They're like, oh, well, maybe they had a bad day and it like, it gets you from not being angry. Right. So let's look at it. Everybody, oh, they're making mm-hmm. money off of me. What do you think they're doing with the money that they're making? They're probably buying more comics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. You know, it's like, right. we, 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 talk, about, we talk about guys, that all the time. And I think it's, it's not like, yeah, you know. I'm going to go buy this Rolls Royce. You know, <laughs> buy more comics. Right. So it's like they're, it's fueling the habit. Um, and of course, you want people not to be jerks and underhanded and stuff like that, of course. But that's going to be right. in the industry. But uh, yeah, like. And there's always going to be people who are going to abuse. And you can't, yep. that, you can't do anything about that other than put practices in place from a retail perspective that try to avoid that. But, you know, people are going to be so, people. And you. It's yeah. tough. You can't. I don't want. I don't want some jerk who walks into a store and takes thirty off a shelf so a kid can't get a book to be, you know, related to yeah. me and what we're trying to do. That's why we advocate pre-ordering and oh, FOC absolutely. ordering and purchasing directly from publishers and conventions and things like that. But and that's what we're. we're I mean, from a business standpoint, direct to consumer is the best. It's just the mm-hmm. way it is. But I'm also a huge believer in the local comic shop. I think it's amazing. It, it's 
what you're missing by not going to a local comic shop is the camaraderie. It's, it's your cheers, man. You know, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. you go in and you hang out and you get back issues and you have that community. And I yep. think that, um, you know, that would be my recommendation to any comic shop is just, that's what makes you different. Cause you know, well, the whole is like a lot of people are like, well, diamonds and monopoly, which is true. And mm -hmm. you know, the, who has the distribution? What big companies have the distribution to actually tackle diamond and that's walmart or amazon yeah and i remember when i was saying that to people it's like yeah it'd be nice if they got into it they're like well that would ruin the local comic shop i'm like i disagree because local comic shops if you look at it from a, di a standpoint the diamond order the weekly order that's essentially advertising that's getting people in the door where their profit margins lie are on the back issues right you know, it's those books that they bought for $1.50 that all of a sudden now is the first appearance of XYZ and is going for $40. That's the profit margins or the collections that they're buying, right? The other stuff is just advertising that you hope to break even because if you're just trying to be a distribution hub at 50 to – it's just – it's, it's not going to work, man. It's tough. What was that? I said it's essentially a prediction game for it retailers is. at that point dealing with new comic books and – yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. You can't you can't operate that. But that's why when people talk about stores closing, I also say you're also seeing you're seeing stores close, but you, you kind of see common threads with a lot of the stores that close. It's a lot of the old guard that didn't change with the development of the times. Your store has to be customer friendly. It has to be female friendly. It has to be children friendly. So the old days of like the smelly sweatpants, you know, the, the comic book guy from Simpsons um, that, you know, that uninviting Mm -hmm. has has not worked and uh you gotta, you gotta have the diverse product you've got to have um a friendly sales staff that's providing huge. customer service that's you the, right there right yep. and well that's the thing as i said i'm a retail professional and i it's funny i walk into to um you know comic book shops all the time hundreds a year and and literally at the percentage that you see what would be like retail industry standard customer service is so low so that's the stuff that needs to get better for the industry because the, those are the people that are going to turn people on books and things like that. And that's not going to happen if you can't build that dialogue you were talking about. That You got to have that through customer service. So I'm glad to see a lot of new shops popping up, though, that are popping up and, and have that right vibe and feel. So I just think it's turning over. It's, it's a process. I, I want to throw this out there. If any shops are listening to this or any guy, people who are opening shops or whatever, contact, contact me at info at scout we love helping people out bookstore idea or book club ideas that we do where we give discounts and we can do live feeds or if you're local and there's a creator there we can schedule that creator to come out and do like a book a bookstore you know where if you do a book club and then at the end of the book club you have the a q a with one of the creators um we send out free stuff uh like giveaways to help promote your your poll service like seriously contact us at info at scoutcomics.com and we can set up retailer codes. I think that's what's missing in the industry too, is is people willing to help and, it, and being it together as a team. You know, I go back to what I told about what we're looking for in creators, but the same thing with partners, like comic stores. I will bend over backwards with comic shops like BAMP, Hero Trader. I can list tons of them that I've been dealing with locally and abroad ever since being part of Scout. and. You know, I will spend my own money to help them out if they're awesome, good people, you know, and they're willing to help their customers and, and build their business together instead of being one sided, you know. So. James, 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 James. May I call you James? Uh, sure. Jim, Jamie. Right. Jimmy. Right you guys recently released a sampler book this past free comic book day that preview that previewed several new titles yep. what was the reception for that free comic book day release and can you tell us a little about those upcoming those upcoming titles that were in it sure uh we had this was our second free comic book day release last year it was the mall my book the mall uh this year is midnight sky which is uh, jim pruitt's book who did midnight or Midnight, uh, did Mindbender, and uh, Scott Van Demillion, who I was talking about earlier, who did Smoke Town. This is like Invasion of the Body Snatchers meets They Live, where there's changelings, and I've been privy to read the first issue, and I'm super excited. I think it's going to be our best-selling book of all time, uh, and some 
big retailers also agree with that statement and they've said that but uh comes out it's being solicited next month comes out in september but that was our main focus there was an eight page uh preview story in it uh the second one was actually my other book called uh long live pro wrestling that's gonna be part of the binge line as well which is like a backstage look at professional wrestling my goal as a writer on this one was to basically even if you did i have a love affair with with pro wrestling i've been a fan i'm a comic fan it's it's a natural segue a lot of times i haven't I've been embarrassed because it's really <laughs> poorly done, but uh, this is my lo love letter to professional professional wrestling. A lot of times it's the behind the scenes. What goes on behind the scenes is that's the most fascinating, even more so than what's happening story-wise. And that's what this does, where the character Evan Dandy was an underside wrestler, could never quite make it, goes to this event where he transcends the industry and he's put in a position to either help it or destroy it. So that's kind of the gist of the situ of what that story is about. Uh, we released the number zero. It's part of the binge line. You can buy it now. But uh, we did a prequel story for that. And then we also had Gut Ghost, which is a series of one shots that we're going to do by a good friend of mine, Enzo Garza. Uh, you want to talk about indie cred. I've, there's been two books that I've seen on the convention level that have gotten zombie-like approaches like people are obsessed cosplayers um just fans uh pictures like fan art and that's been stabity bunny which is one of our best-selling titles of all time and gut ghost and gut ghost is now being brought it was in heavy metal uh, he self-published initially and then was uh done in heavy metal magazine quite a few times and now this is going to be his first of hopefully many one shots that he does that st tells an overall story. So like Metal Shark Bro, it's kind of our adult swim play. Uh, it's great art. He all does it by himself. And I love it. It's quirky. Uh, it reminds me of the indie comics that I grew up back in the 90s. Jeff Darrow, um, you know, Evan Dorkin, Scud the Disposable Assassin, that kind of vibe. So that comes out in June. And that was a, a little uh, self-contained story, too. And then uh, we have Devereaux which is our horror base. It's like Candyman meets um, uh, Matt. Oh, what's that? Uh, Year of a Slave, I believe the movie was called. Mm -hmm. And it's written and, and helped develop by Jim Pruitt. But uh, the writer is Vincent Ward, who played Oscar on Walking Dead. So that's okay. coming out next year. And then we have Headless, which is our like paper girls version of the Headless Horseman. Uh, it takes place in the 1987. It's very, very cool. There was a preview of that. And I'm trying to think what else. Uh, Snow, <laughs> Snow White, White Zombie Apocalypse, or I mean, Zombie Apocalypse, not White. That's <laughs> kind of self-explanatory. That's a one shot, but when you guys see this art, the painted art in this, it's unbelievable. And from what I understand, it's actually an off-Broadway play. It's based on an off-Broadway play, wow. so it's a very unique take on this one. But the art is like, at, like Alex Ross, amazing. Yeah, that, that uh, the paint, painted art thing. You guys have been uh, been on the painted art there. Yeah, good. with Rise. I, I actually yeah. got to meet him uh, this weekend, this past weekend in Phoenix Fan Fusion. Uh, yeah. It's Don Aguello. He's yeah. the creator of Rise. One of the nicest. When, when I was talking about that family and team, like he gets it. Like he came by. We hung out. He's such a nice guy. If you guys haven't read that, it's, it's, a, it's an epic. It's yeah. Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones. You mix in... Oh, it's just so well done. It's so big, well done. Big, big boy reading. Big boy reading. It, it is. It, it yeah. is. Give it, it. It's a lot of words, but it's good words. Yeah. It's, it's, my recommendation in the paint, the painting, the art is just jaw dropping. Yeah. It's all, it's all important. It's great drop today, by the way. I don't know if you guys saw that. I it did, dropped yeah, in comic yeah. stores today. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's uh, that's the series that's uh. It's definitely got a shot to go somewhere, like you say, Lord of the Rings, Lord of the Ring type ish. It's 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 creating a a, a huge world. Is yep. what it seems like, and, it's, and not uh, not to kill, uh, you know the the fact that we you know that's coming out traditional, right? Man, that's going to read so cool as a trade. <laughs> oh, yeah, no oh, doubt. It's going to be oh, it's going to be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got a lot of a lot of good uh, titles. Uh, sounds like on the horizon, and I can't. Yeah, uh, can't wait Winter to Category Zero. That that's the one I'm really looking forward to. Is X Men fans out there? If you want to see a realistic take on X Men, this Category Zero is way for it's it's great. The art, 
art kind of reminds me a little bit of a J. J. Scott Campbell ish, like a little bit cleaner tone. And the writing is top notch, top notch on this. And I think it's, this is going to be a big underdog. So if I got it today, it's coming out in two weeks. That's awesome. That's uh, that's one to look out for, people, for sure. And again, check us out at scoutcomics.com slash store. We always release it a couple days before. Um, and myself and my team, we handle all the shipment down here in Fort Myers. And by the way, remember, like I said, I'm a collector. We pack like collectors. Yeah, Should, I, can, like, I, can, I can attest to that for sure. Yes. I, I, I've, I've received some stuff, and I mean, it's coming in a Gemini, and and yep. like you said, it's uh, it's done right. So you can you can order with confidence at scout.com uh, for sure. I think that's a very big key for all you guys out there. Now we talk a lot about the, the value of ordering from publishers and direct from publishers, but one of the downsides is that publishers have a reputation with poor packaging. And I think that the point that James just made, them being collectors and packaging like collectors, is very, very, very key. Um, definitely something to be on the lookout for. And be on the lookout now for that free comic book day issue, which, of course, was on the Bolo list for free comic book day. And for the exact reasons that James outlined, as it previewed in first first appearances of characters in all of these series, is that that give a lot of reason to be excited for and your first opportunity to pick that up is that free comic book day issue so if you haven't added that issue to your collection yet be sure to do that because remember what that umbrella academy free comic book day issue did there's no limit to what can happen with these free comics at this point and again small press it, it, it probably wasn't in as many stores as that spider-man book so be on the lookout for that if your lcs still has those copies laying around and shoot if you order from scout i'll gladly throw in we got some uh we got some overage of course so, and if you come see us at any of the uh, cons that we're going, we're, we're giving them out to people. So that's another way to get them. There, there you go, go. Major Polo. So Denver, uh, Fort Myers, Heroes Con, uh, New York Comic Con. I can keep, yeah, lots of cons. <laughs> is, is Baltimore in there? Baltimore's in there, yes, sir. You're going to come, you, I'll save you a copy. Yeah, we'll be at Baltimore, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, well, Heroes Con and Baltimore. Andy and I will be at uh, Heroes Con, and Brian and I will be in Baltimore. Sweet, those are awesome. Those are comic book shows. Yes, yes, that's the that's that's the point because we're trying to get as much content as possible from indie comics community. I think those are the shows to do it at. Yeah, for sure. I heard Denver's like that. I'm very anxious to to see. I heard it, it, it's one of the you know one of the great ones. Emerald City is like that. Emerald City Comic Con in, in Seattle. You yeah. learn. You learn a few things uh, traveling the circuit. Yeah, I'm ready to get out. I want to get to that Emerald City one for sure. Yeah, it's awesome. My sister owns a comic shop out in Seattle called um, Outsider Comics. And you know, just to to go back real quick, when you're talking about customer service, my sister and her and her husband, my brother-in-law, they do it right. Like, have you heard of Odyssey by Image? It's by my Matt Fraction. It's basically a read. Yep. retelling of yep. Homer's Odyssey. And I tried getting into it, and it was just one I didn't really get into, quite honestly. And I love Matt Fraction. Mm -hmm. uh, my sister and brother-in-law love it. And my sister comes from the same background as I do, where she takes, she was in retail, she worked at Chico's, one of the first employees of that women's clothing line, Chico's, which started here where we grew up. Yeah. And uh, she managed a lot of stores until she uh, got her degree and whatnot. But anyways, she gave me a list of her top sellers in the past six months and she sold like 70 copies of the graphic novel odyssey wow. that was her number one seller and that was because of their customer service and how passionate they would talk about it people yeah. would buy it and i yeah. just found that so fascinating and keep in mind they're in seattle what's what's it also in seattle that has same day delivery amazon and you know you could have got Odyssey much cheaper at Amazon than paying essentially full price at a comic store. And yeah. that's why I think people are willing to pay more to support their 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 local businesses. Yeah. Totally agree. I mean, and that, and that's a good thing, you know? I mean, uh, that's awesome. I had no idea uh, that, that your sister uh, owned a shop. That's that's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, she caters um, it, towards women and LGBT, LGBTQ. That's awesome. And um, she... It's called Outsider Comics and Geek Boutique. And her background, again, was in fashion. So she's taking a lot of, like, up-and-coming designers and stuff that, like, do, like, 
sci-fi and, and comic based wow. dresses and, and clothing. And it's a really cool niche that she's done. And they've been in business for about three years and just developed a, a really strong, loyal following. And yeah, it's awesome. It's a nice, unique take on it. Like you mentioned, you guys mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, try to cater towards different, not your typical comic book guy from the Simpsons. Right. You know? And their number one seller is clothing and graphic novels, not individual sales. So it's, it's right. cool, man. That's all. There's ways to do it out there. You just got to think out of the box sometimes, you know? No doubt. Yeah, that, that was exactly, I think that was exactly what I was trying to kind of get at. And you yeah. articulated it perfectly there. What you got to do in today's market to be successful. I like it. Yeah. And I have a, another idea. I haven't really shared it with anybody yet. Well, I've shared it with a couple of my business partners, but uh, I have a, we have a phase two, not just a binge, but another thing about how to get, get readers and I'll give you guys a couple hints because I'm, I'm looking to get it kind of copyrighted right now or trade or patented but um, what it does essentially is I'll ask you guys this quick question when you were young and got into comics where did you buy your comics the, the grocery store uh, newsstand right the newsstand I was about to say I actually bought from an actual newsstand until I was in yeah. my teenage years News, newsstand so yeah. the newsstand's dead now it just it doesn't exist or if it does, it's it's like, I mean, it, it's not there. So how, as an industry, do we get new readers? And you know what it is? These. Yep. Mm -hmm. Tablets, phones. So okay. what do we do? It's digital. So you know how in Benj, I came up with the idea, you know, not came, uh, helped the, the idea of, you have the individual, you cater to the collectors. Why is it that digital, that no comic shop likes it, no one likes it? Like you and I, as all of us who are collectors, why do we not like digital? Well, because there's no collectability to digital. You know, you can keep it, but guess what? It's I'll tell you, it's better on the eyes. It's cool. You can actually see the art better. It's, it's actually a very cool way to read a comic. Um, well, that and comic stores are selling physical goods that's what they're in the business so, studies, so. so comic stores look at it, it's like man why would i do this this is my ultimate competition well i think i found a way how you cater to both so i'll leave it at that and i'll gladly once everything gets i'm we're building prototypes and stuff but i have a I just this idea that i think is going to really help revolutionize stuff and quite honestly i how i told you about the binge thing like i would care less if someone would would do it too, like copy it because all it's going to do is help the industry. I hope they copy in this scenario too. I truly do because I think once they copy this, it's going to really help bring new readers into comic stores and into comics. Well, we'll definitely have to do a follow up episode and bring you on for sure once yeah. uh, you're ready to unveil that and talk about that because I think yeah, I mean, I'm excited right. about it because everybody, I mean, my wife is very, uh, she's very upfront about things and when i told her about it she's like oh. she's like james that's that's a million dollar idea i'm like yeah right <laughs> so and she doesn't give that out she doesn't give that that kind of uh she doesn't say that very easily that's so uh, i'm excited about it. it's not uh, quite honestly it, it isn't about the money uh, and this scenario i just i'm really excited about it i think it's going to be a rather small investment to start it up and then we're going to test market it with scout and then uh kind of bring it to the other publishers too so that's my this a little breaking news but i can't wait to share it there's a, there's a little, little bolo for you guys out there well uh james now um kind of pivot a little bit here um variants have been a big part of scout success uh especially on the secondary market and i know uh some you, you have some incentives coming from the upcoming releases Tell us a little bit about scout strategy when it comes to variants and incentive variants. Well, we always do an incentive variant for a lot of our, our number one issues, or if there's a rhyme or reason behind it. Um, like for example, electric black, we have two artists who do the book and both of them want to do a cover, which naturally makes sense. Uh, then you have my book, like the mall, um, where it takes place in the eighties. So instead of just doing one for the first issue, we like doing little cover, you know, eighties movie poster homages. So we've been doing that and that's been very popular. And then Stabity Bunny has done very well offer after, you know, with numerous variants that they do with uh, famous 
Miss Kalanj is there. So I, I'm a believer in it. That's where the market is. Um, yeah, it's something that we do store exclusives. We do web store exclusives. We're trying to drive people to our web stores. And quite honestly, from a publishing standpoint, it's a win-win-win for everybody in the sense of we make the most money off of variants. The creators make the most money off the variants. And a lot of times the speculators in the community make, there's room to move on that where they can, like we were talking earlier about help funding their, their habit of buying more comics. So as this variant, we live in a time of variance and until that changes, we, we cater towards that. I would say for sure. So we don't want to, I mean, there's definitely a fine line between overdoing it and underdoing it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a work in progress. I'm going to do it. It's not overdone, which some people can, you know, like star Wars, number one from Marvel that had like what, 150 variants. So all in all, I mean, to be quite honest, I think variants hurt the industry as a whole, but um, right now it's helping it. So it's one of those things where I don't think you can go back once it started. It's like when you, once you stretch a rubber band, <laughs> it doesn't go back to normal. So yeah, until that happens, I, I think it's a cool aspect of it. Like some of the coolest things from what DC and Marvel are like the, the art germ variants that they do and the Josh Middleton ones on Aquaman. And yeah, I mean, it helped those, I imagine those are lower selling titles. Um, Aquaman, Batgirl, et cetera. But because of those cool little cover B variants, man, it's really helped put eyeballs on those titles. So there's a lot of good for it. Well, in turn, there's a lot of bad. Yeah. Like yeah. anything you should try to do in moderation, you know? Yeah. I totally, uh, totally agree with that. I mean, I, I definitely collect them. I'm, I'm, I'm a big variant guy, but I, yeah. I, I understand the, the damage that they can do to the market too, you know? So, I mean, it's a, but with the slabbing, it makes sense, right? Because you can't open the book once it's slabbed. All you can do is see the cover. So, yeah, yep, and, right. and I'll tell you what, just looking at, uh, like, looking at the CGC, the cases that they have, it's just, they're things of beauty, man. Oh, dude. You know? oh, see, the way they do it is just wonderful. And I'll tell you what, one of the most gratifying thing being a creator, when you actually have your book slabbed too the first time and you see it, it just, uh, and you have it hanging on your wall, it's, it's great. Oh yeah, no, I, I, I can only imagine, dude. That uh, that 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 makes it all worthwhile to see it like that. Oh, it does for sure, man. So, James, do you or Scout as a company do you guys track secondary market sales of releases, or is that? Yeah, um, we do. Um, that's more of me being a fan. I don't think a lot of publishers do, but we do. Yeah. Uh, it's really cool. I think the fact that we make it re readily available before I was with scout, one of the big hits was, uh, uh, hench girl and once our land. And because we didn't have a very active store, um, in place, it, it dried up real quick and you saw like huge numbers. If of course it's come back to earth, like a lot of stuff does. I'm, I'm mainly referring to hench girl number one, but, uh, yeah, I, I follow it and, it's like a fine line. I've talked, I talked to Mel V all the time about it where it's like, you don't want to like, we want to offer it and we want to like, I, I think I've said this before, but any, how our web store works and how our royalties and maybe I'm revealing too much, but our royalties on our website, we split after the cost of printing is taken care of. We split 50, 50. So, you know, we put a certain amount on our web uh, web store, say like 250 of this variant or, actually more realistic it's like 100 we put 100 on there and just say we did 300 the first 100 we sell at 10 bucks and then what happens when we sell out of that then we up it to 15 we'll put 50 on and once those sell up we you know done we move to 20 and we cap it at 20. Yeah. so that's how we look at it and a lot we still want to leave meat on the bone for potential you know speculation i guess but just keep in mind what I tell people, even if they kind of get like perturbed, because they much, I'm sure they would much rather buy it at four bucks and then sell it themselves for 20 or 30 or 40 or 50, or whatever. It just goes back into the creator's pocket. And I don't think a lot of publishers are doing that, to be quite honest. I think they pay at the, the time of printing based on the, like the diamond numbers, and then that's it. Yeah. So when we do that price level, man, that like, you know, at tw at 20 bucks, 10 of it go into the create directly to the creator. Yep. which is awesome. And that's kind of what I wanted to reiterate there. I mean, it, it, that, that is really awesome because it's almost like supporting your cause. 
Yeah. You know? I mean, you're, 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 you're paying a little bit more, but that money is going to the creator. The creator at that point, he's wanting to write more stuff, keep it going. I mean, it's, it's all about the, the process. And I mean, I think that's, that's a huge thing that half of that money is going to the creators. Like you say, I, I do not think there's very few, if any, that are doing that other than you. And I kind of want to, I'm not sure if everybody knows this, but especially with indie comics guys, like, People who do indie comics, even if it's a huge hit, the best that they can think of, they can do currently, at least in the short term, is break even. This is a labor of love that we're all doing. It doesn't matter which company you are, whether it's Scout, whether it's you know Aftershock. Um, yeah, it, it just they're doing it because they love it and they want to get tell stories and get it out there. So any bit you can help those creators, especially if you like those stories or you like that company, it is to buy directly from them. Or a company like us buying from us to help give yeah. that to them. Yeah. Because they're not going to get rich off of selling comic books, unfortunately. Um, hopefully that changes. <laughs> but that's where it's so key with a company like ours, how we look at the multimedia too. Because then you can actually make more make money. Is if yeah. you sell it, if you option it, if it becomes something more. Um, and more so now than ever before, that's possible. Well, James, James, now we've talked about um, we've talked about retailers and the relationship with Scout Comics. Um, we've talked about variants. So let's talk about retailer variants. Um, what is it Scout is looking for when they partner with a retailer um, to create a uh, exclusive variant for a shop? So usually they contact myself or Jim, and we start. Uh, we kind of arrange it. We have a certain price schedule that we break up. But keep in mind, you know, some some people want to get their own, I guess, cover artists. But ultimately, like I, like I said at the beginning, it's creator owned. So the creators have to approve said cover. Um, but we have them all available. We usually like to cap it at a certain amount. So we, like I said earlier as well, like you don't want to overwhelm, you know, like overwhelm people with having too many variants out there. But uh, we love working with the shops. We've worked with many of them now and we hope to, to continually grow that relationship because that is such a, it's a huge, it's a, it's a profitable venture. These variants, especially to store variants for everyone involved, including the store, the consumer, the creator and the publisher. So yeah, I, that's something that's part of our business model and I, I hope it continues. And if anyone's interested, again, just reach out to us. We have it available, but uh, just again, keep in mind that sometimes, you know, we've had to have some, I guess awkward conversations where it's like, hey, listen, they didn't approve it. Sorry. I mean, it's their baby. Ultimately, this is what it is. But um, luckily, that hasn't happened that much. <laughs> but it can get odd. That's for sure. So we heard a bunch of great information from James Hake himself tonight from Scout Comics. Also, if you want to purchase any of these comics, make sure you go to scoutcomics.com. I'll put the link to that in the description of this video. Check it out. They got a bunch of great web exclusive variants that you won't find anywhere else so scoutcomics.com also once again james thank you so much for joining us tonight you gave us so much great information and with that being said do you have any last words for our audience sure just want to thank everybody for the support and the growth that uh, i mean we wouldn't have been able to grow if it wasn't for you know the listeners of people you know of your show and people like you guys um keep doing what you're doing. I love what you guys are doing. I have since the start, even before I was with Scout. And, you know, if you want to find uh, support Scout, like you said, at scoutcomics.com slash store. And uh, my titles, uh, The Mall, um, The Mall, quote unquote. <laughs> and also uh, Solar Flare and Long Live Pro Wrestling. Um, yeah, just uh, follow me on Facebook at... Uh, uh, what is it Solar Flare Comic or The Mall Comic or Long Live Pro Wrestling and of course Scout Comics and then Twitter at James Hake or at Scout Comics and Instagram at James Hake 3. My dad or my buddies call me Jimmy Three Sticks because I'm James Hake third. <laughs> so I got all kinds of different uh, nicknames, but it's uh, yeah, Jimmy Three Sticks on Instagram. And uh, yeah, again, I appreciate being on and anytime. I'd love to come back and uh, tell you a little bit more about that one idea as well because I'm super excited. So I'm hoping maybe I'll have more info on it in like August. Wow. Well, James, I can't uh, thank you enough for coming on the show with us tonight. And you just shared so much information and there's so much more that's uh, to come. Uh, man, we can't wait to have you back on the show again. And uh, just wanted to tell everybody, thank you for watching and uh, 
tune in because there's uh, definitely going to be more. You're going to be hearing a lot more from uh, Scout and uh, James in the future, I believe, and uh, a lot of his titles. Appreciate it, fellas. No, thank, thank you, James. Yeah, like, like the fella said, we appreciate having you here. Guys, definitely be on the lookout for that Scout Comics free comic book day issue like we talked about, previewing those upcoming series is dropping soon. And uh, definitely be on the lookout for uh, Metal Shark Bro and all the other releases coming upcoming from the uh, binge line. And uh, we definitely got to have James come back on the channel. We got to talk alternative releases. We got retailer strategies. But we didn't even get a chance to get into Hollywood optioning. And we're, we definitely need to talk about that next. So, James, we'll have to have you back. There's so much Scout Comics information to talk about. I think it's going to take two episodes. You know, you know it'll be a great time to have me back right after San Diego because I'm going to do the meetings again. And uh, yeah, I'll be able to yep. give you some uh, fresh in insight directly off the meeting. So, let's, let's plan for. Nice. Uh, Late July. I think that'll be a good that time. That sounds like a great plan. Great plan. Be on the lookout for that episode, everybody. Simpleman's Comics family, uh, YouTube comic community, uh, CBSI Nation, comicbookinvest.com, of course, where you can find the Indie Spotlight series article every Tuesday, uh, dropping early, letting you know what big indie titles, what small indie titles, anything in the independent comic community that's making a buzz. Andy's going to let you know every Tuesday, right before New Comic Book Day. So you can head to your LCS and make those smart decisions. And again, thank you, James, for joining us today. No problem, guys. And hey, everybody out there listening, let's do them a favor and give them a high rating on uh, Google Play or Apple Podcasts. And, and uh, so hit the subscribe button like I did just before the show. So again, thanks, guys. I look forward to coming back and uh, great talking with you and, and meeting a lot of you guys, even though I feel like I've known known y'all for a long time based on the videos that i've watched and the articles that i've read for years so keep doing what you're doing and uh we'll talk soon and thank you guys for watching make sure you comment down below if you guys have questions for james put them in the comments as well and we'll make sure he gets them and again thank you james and like he said make sure you click that like button make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you get the audio version and if you haven't already done so click that subscribe with that bell notification so you never miss when a future video like this drops. Good night, guys.